Okay, we're recording now. Please go ahead. Okay, so um, I'm going to call the uh, Town Services and Outreach Committee meeting of April uh, 25th to order. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I think we have four of the five members of the committee present. And uh, I want to start by uh, acknowledging that this has been a challenging meeting for all of us to plan. And I appreciate everybody's patience with uh, and uh, participation. And uh, this meeting is being held by Zoom, as is permitted by uh, the open meeting law, as has been amended by the, the legislature. Um, it is a, a virtual meeting. And so uh, members of the public can access the meeting by Zoom or by telephone. And uh, with that, uh, I want to uh, um, see that everybody who's um, participating in the meeting as a member can be heard and uh, we can hear them. So uh, Bob Hegner. Present. And Councillor Ryan. I'm present. And Councilor Lord. Okay, so we have uh, and we have several other people who are present in the meeting, and uh, I just acknowledge uh, that um, uh, we're going to start uh, with uh, sort of a very different schedule because of the town manager's uh, availability today is limited at the beginning of the meeting. And uh, he may be able to join us again towards the end. But um, as a result, what we're going to do is uh, have uh, ask him to introduce the first topic of discussion today. There are three major topics of discussion. Um, the police chief appointment, which uh, the way that um, we are set up is that this committee will review the appointment, make a recommendation to the council for action. And uh, so that's one item. Uh, the Belcher Town Road um, improvements uh, also is an action item. And then uh, um, we're hoping that uh, most of the meeting we can talk about this uh, topic of outreach and the outreach role of the town services and outreach committee. So um, I'm going to um, postpone um, public comment for um, a few minutes and uh, so that we can uh, uh, hear um, from the town manager for um, his uh, presentation. So Paul, uh, why don't you uh, introduce the first item, which is the uh, police chief uh, appointment and uh, it required council action. Thank you. And can you hear me clearly enough? Yes. Okay. So thank you for accommodating. And I just want to note that uh, Melissa Lajochi Walker is also here. She's our director of HR, and she was very intimate with the management of this process. Um, so the you received the memo that appoints um, G Captain Gabriel Ting, Act temporary chief, uh, to be the permanent police chief. This um, uh, appointment now goes to the town council and you have the ability to say yes, uh, no, or take no action, in which case it's automatically approved. Um, and then, and you have 14 days to do that, which is a week from uh, 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 May 7th, I think it is the date. Um, the, and I think the this is an unusual appointment that you normally because the second the the two finalists were both publicly uh, vetted and and there was public sessions mm -hmm. and many of the counselors participated or watched those sessions. So I want to talk about Gabe. Um, I uh, appoint Gabe based on and it was we had very two strong two very strong candidates by virtue of his education, his training, his work experience, working for the town for twenty seven years. 
um, I think he clearly uh, speaks to the qualities that we would seek in a new police chief. Um, his life story is the, the story of many people from Amherst. Um, he's, he's a first generation immigrant, um, been being born in Argentina to uh, Chinese Ameri Chinese parents and uh, then moved to um, Amherst as a child and then uh, went through K-12 Amherst schools, went to the University of Massachusetts to get his bachelor's degree, Western New England University to get his master's degree in criminal justice, um, and then came to work for the Amherst Police Department and has grown through the ranks in a really um, uh, positive way where he has served in pretty much every capacity uh, in the police department from being an officer, a sergeant, a uh, detective, uh, managing the operations of the of the department uh, as, and with uh, another captain. So when I looked at the qualities that we had articulated in advance of what we were looking for, uh, leadership was one of the key features. Um, Gabe has, brings a high level of professionalism. Um, he was also a uh, union president at one point um, early in his career, and that also has helped it helpful in, as being chief because you understand both sides of the table. Um, he was um, a core member of our CRESS implementation team, and um, he, we were fortunate that he was able to dedicate Sergeant Janet Griffin to the interim management team when there was a changeover in leadership at the CRESS department. Mm -hmm. um, he has done all the jobs, um, and when asked to step up to be the uh, temporary chief, he willingly did that, and and that actually gave me a, a good piece of time to observe his ability to do the job, which I really um, was happy to to be part of. Um, in terms of uh, his communication skills, I think he has really strong communication skills. He's a very good listener. Um, he has. Um, made a commitment to uh, community engagement and connecting with the community. He's, um, and especially he's, he's really focused on connecting with youth um, and has, you know, he didn't have the easiest childhood. And, uh, and so he knows what it's like to be a youth in, in Amherst. And also he has a great familiarity with um, college students and the college community. Um, and in terms of his uh, professional progressive policing, which is one thing we really looked at, he's um, um, committed to the establishment of the CREST program. He's committed to the establishment of the resident oversight board. Um, and, you know, and, and in terms of the CREST program, he, he and I, he actually served on, he's, he's made presentations to the International Association of Chiefs of Police and to the um, International City Management Association um, and at the Inter International Town Gown Association about the CREST program. So he's out there advocating for the program as well. So in terms of all those things, his progressive approach to policing, his um, management style, his proven in the trenches work, um, his respect within the police department and in the broader community, I think he is a really strong uh, appointment for the next chief of police. I'm happy to take questions or anything from this year. So what I'm going to do is um, see if there are questions from members of the committee. Then I'm going to do. Uh, we're going to go to public comment because if anybody wants to offer public comment regarding this appointment, it would be inappropriate for us to have a motion on the table before we hear public comment. Mm -hmm. So uh, the second question, knowing that. Um, Paul has a conflict uh, in, uh, he's gonna have to leave for in a minute. Are there questions for the town manager from the committee? Councilor Ryan. Not really so much a question as a, just a brief comment. I think the town manager is to be commended um, on a very extensive and thorough search. Um, I think it's simple fact that we had and have a very strong internal candidate um, but nonetheless, he mounted, um, I think, a, a very extensive and uh, deep search, and uh, it has resulted, I think, in an excellent uh, nomination, and uh, I am happy to see it. Um, and again, I express my appreciation to Paul for his work and for the committee um, that he formed mm -hmm. and the work that they did.
Thank you. Anybody else from the committee? Um, I'm going to, uh, I know we have uh, four people in the um, attendee list, and I have what, see one hand up. I'm going to assume that uh, that individual, uh, which is Bob Kuzner, wishes to be um, brought into the uh, room. So uh, why don't we do that, Athena? Um, are you are you doing three minute public comments? Yes. Um, given the we, we have a small number of people, we will allow three minutes for public comment. So, uh, Mr. Kasner, good can morning, you hear me, folks. Hello. Can you? Uh, we can hear you. Great, great. Hey, um, I, I mainly wanted to comment later on the later agenda item, but it's serendipitous that this appointment has come at the same time. I, I echo what uh, uh, Councillor Ryan said, uh, and I really commend Paul, but I, I, we have to commend Gabe Ting, who is one of the finest uh, officers. I met him when I was fairly new to Amherst also. I was chairing the Transportation Committee, and I believe he showed up maybe with a bicycle in his rookie year as a police officer. He's a wonderful guy, and I, I can't imagine a better appointment. I know there was a careful vetting process, and I do want to echo what George said about uh, Paul and the committee's uh, thoroughness in this. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a very nice thing, and I congratulate everyone, especially Gabe Ting, on uh, the pending appointment. So it's, it's an endorsement without reservation with great enthusiasm. Later, if when we come back to the to the Belchertown Road project, I, I would like to actually make some detailed comments. It's probably better to let that, if if, if that's possible, because um, otherwise, it's it, what I'll say next is very off topic from the present topic. W will there be a possibility to, to return later to to that? Uh yes. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. And Andy, can I say one other thing? Yes. If there, if there are no other public comment. Um, I, I do want to thank the, the search committee. It, it was a really superb um, search committee. And I, in talking with each member of the search committee, they all really enjoyed being on it and felt um, they really did a good job on terms of the work that they did. And um, it was, I just want to thank them publicly because they all um, really dedicated a lot of time and Everett Henry specifically as, as the chair uh, put a lot of work into this search. So I want to thank, thank him in particular. And uh, of the people present in the room, uh, Melissa was the one member who was on the search committee, I believe. I, I can't say who's in the room, so I don't know. Uh, I think this. Is there anything that you wanted to report about the search committee process, uh, Melissa? Sure. Um, I will echo that it was a really extensive process and really, really thorough. Um, we had a nine member team. I was a part of that as well as a 10th member, but I was really um, responsible for supporting the team. Uh, we met a lot, a lot of discussion. Um, I see that Jennifer Moist and she was also a member of the team is here today. Um, we, the interview team did two rounds of interviews after that, um, Paul and I were able to meet with the candidates to interview them as well. Um, they met with, um, members of the police department, um, animal control and dispatch. And, um, and that culminated in two public sessions in which we get gather, excuse me, gathered feedback from the public, um, and, and reviewed that feedback before making this, the decision. So, Again, very thorough, and I'm very proud of the process. And I, I think we came out with a great candidate. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Um, did you have any? I, as a member of the committee, do you have anything that you want to comment on? Um, I think that the committee did a very good job of uh, going through and vetting or choosing and selecting the different candidates. It was very lengthy um, and very long, but the team worked really well together. 
um, as we were all looking to choose the best candidate. It was nice working with folks. It's always nice when you're working with people from the community in a different kind of aspect like that. So it was great. And Everell did a wonderful job as, so I really just echo what um, Paul and Melissa said. Everell did a very, very good job. It was nice to have Chief Parham there just to understand the experience that he brings and has to kind of apply it to what Gabe will need and has. Oh, so thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the committee or from the TSO committee? If not, um, I'm going to make a motion and see if any, but if there's a second, the motion being that the town services outreach committee recommends to the town council that it confirm the appointment of Gabriel Ting as police chief. I'll second. So the motion has been seconded by uh, Bob Hagner. Any further discussion? If not, we'll proceed to a vote. Um, so uh, we will go to a vote. Bob uh, Bob Hagner. Aye. Uh, Councilor Lord. Abstain. Uh, Councilor Ryan. Aye. No, I'm in the aye. So that it is uh, passed with three in favor, one member um, abstaining, and one member absent. So the motion carries. Thank you. Okay. And uh, you might be back later in the meeting. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to uh, uh, go back to the Belchertown Road proposal. And uh, I want to first get reports from um, the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee and the Disability Access Advisory Committee. We have asked them to, um, as committees, to review the proposal. Then we're going to go back to public comment um, after we've had an opportunity for counselors to ask questions regarding those reports um, and uh, hear from uh, if there are any further comments from Superintendent Moran. So uh, with that, um, is that agreeable to the committee? It's a process. Okay, uh, Tracy, uh, you had provided a written report and appreciate that. Uh, is there uh, anything additional that you would like to uh, say, uh, report to the committee or emphasize from your written report? You are muted. Yeah. yeah, I got it. Um, hi, good morning. Um, we appreciate uh, TAC being asked for their feedback on this project. Um, I, I did have a few comments, and I just, in case anybody hadn't read the report, I can just provide a quick summary too. Um, so, you know, based on the memo that was sent to the council by the superintendent Maureen and the town manager. Um, our understanding was that we were asked to um, weigh in and provide some feedback on a very, it's a very small section of Belchertown Road, and it's part of a much larger project. Um, for example, our, the section that we were looking at, it doesn't include the intersection with Southeast Street, and then it also just extends a little bit beyond the Colonial Village um, driveway. So again, it's a very short section. Um, you know, as written in the memo, uh, TAC really does support improving bike ped access, of course, through all town, but particularly in this intersection and along Belchertown Road. We have the Fort River School and we have the new school being built there. It's definitely in need of attention. Um, so we support it overall. Um, we were asked to um, the memo talks about the crosswalk that's proposed there. That crosswalk seems like it's very essential um, because 
the one main bus stop in that area for the PVTA and UMass Transit System is at Colonial Village. There is no crosswalk in that vicinity right now. And also at the um, main intersection with the Southeast Street, um, you know, that's not the best intersection for pedestrian access either. Um, and there are reports too, you know, in terms of pedestrians crossing to get to the bus stop, even if there isn't a crosswalk, um, because that's what people who get on and off buses will do when they need to. So definitely we support that in terms of for safety and accessibility. Um, we were also asked about the bike lanes on this section. Again, this is a very short section of Belchertown Road. And I do have some questions about, um, you know, implementing that without having a longer section of Belchertown Road being made bike lanes. We had some concerns about the transition, like if you have a short section and then you, you know, the bicycles are going back into traffic and the related signage that needed there. Um, in addition, there's going to be in the current plans, right, there's not going to be any um, addition besides the bike lane line, there's not gonna be any buffer between where the cars and the trucks are traveling and where the bikes would be traveling. So, you know, if you look at how some of the redesign of Route 9 in Hadley is, they do have a buffer area, the same on University Drive, that can make bicyclists feel safer on that section. Um, I had some questions personally, and we talked about them just a little bit attack, just about how many people would actually be using the bike lane um, because it is a major arterial for Amherst. Um, the recent, you know, the traffic study that was done as part of the Wayfinder project found the average speed, the 85th percentile speed there is just under 40 miles an hour. You know, so it is high speed. We had also heard from people at previous TAC meetings, even in the sidewalk there, that there's a sidewalk on the north side that goes from rolling green towards the intersection. It's a great sidewalk, but even what we were hearing from parents and from others in that vicinity is that even for kids to walk on the sidewalk, you know, they had concerns about the safety of that. So it is a little hard for me to envision that, you know, for the new school and for the new families at the Wayfinder Project and for Colonial Village and so on, that very many people would be using those bike lanes, that people would feel more comfortable staying on the sidewalk. Um, if the sidewalk is in good shape. Um, so that's one of the reasons we raised some of those issues. So again, we were just looking at a very short section. You know, some of our comments are, were beyond the scope of the memo and even beyond scope of the um, things that the council normally considers. You know, for example, the current policy in terms of the jurisdiction of the public way says that decisions on the road signs are, um, the council has designated that authority, delegated that authority to the town manager. Um, but to us, it did seem important to have, if you are gonna have transitions with the bike lane, to have signage for that. And also there's almost no speed limit signs currently in that vicinity. So we don't even provide any information. We're providing, providing very in, little information to drivers about what speeds mm -hmm. they should be going. Um, so again, those seemed important to us. Um, I see Myra is here too. And I will say that I, the comments that Myra made at the last TSO meeting have really been staying with me. You know, she talked about that intersection and how important it is, you know, to be looking at it comprehensively, to be trying to look at the needs mm -hmm. for the traffic, traffic needs, as well as safety needs, accessibility needs, and thinking about them holistically. And so that's why some of our comments, you know, kind of go beyond what the council typically looks at to look at those other things as well. I'm right. So I did, you know, mention the speed limit signs, you know, if there's going to be other road signs related to the crosswalks, those can be helpful. And also the idea about the maintenance, because currently both that side area of the road itself, as well as the sidewalk on the north side, are, they do have a lot of debris and so on, and they're not that safe or friendly to use. So, and that's the extent of my comments. So thank you. Thank you. Uh are you going to be able to stay with us for a few minutes or do you have to leave? Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. I can okay. stay. Okay, if you can stay, then uh, what I'm proposing to do, if um, agreeable to the committee, is ask uh, Myra Ross, who's chair of the Disability Access Advisory Committee, if she has would like to make a uh, uh, report on their committee discussion and recommendation and then uh, 
open it up to the committee to have, if you have questions regarding um, the reports from either of the committees um, and uh, then go back to uh, public comment after that. So, um, Myra. I'm here. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for asking the DAAC for feedback about this. And as I listened to Tracy, I will say they had a much more comprehensive discussion than we did. Um, but I will. Um, this is complicated because the bottom line is we need to keep people safe when they're crossing the street. You're putting in a new crosswalk, um, which will connect Colonial Village to the north side of the street. I'm actually amazed that for all these years, there's been so little access for those people because they go to the Fort River School now. Um, but I'm really glad that you're thinking of putting in the crosswalk. I believe you have rapid flashing beacons on the crosswalk. Is this true? Um, we'll ask uh, in a couple of minutes, Gilford, okay. here and we can ask him. Okay. Well, um, I think that any kind of traffic control, uh, Tracy was talking about inadequate sidewalks on the north side and that cars go through too quickly and that people don't feel safe even walking on that sidewalk, let alone riding their bikes. And um, so I think the bottom line is that there has to be a different speed limit there so that people who are going to be using the crosswalk and are going to be using the bike lane um, actually have some protections. There are kids walking, crossing the street to go to school. Not every kid um, is going to be as, um, well, careful. Let's put it that way. Um, even, you know, 10, 11 year old kids who are gonna be crossing that street on their own, um, they need I, protection with the rapid flashing beacons, protection with slower speeds, protection with making sure they know where the bikes are going to come from. With the DAAC, we were very glad to see, although it's probably in opposition to what Tracy said, we are we were glad to see that the bike lane was not on the sidewalk because if the bike lane is on the sidewalk, people who are walking uh, and people specifically with disabilities who are walking on the sidewalk or using a wheelchair on the sidewalk uh, don't need to be competing with bikes who go out of their lane because they want to pass somebody uh, who aren't really paying attention to where the divider is in the middle of the sidewalk that says this part is for pedestrians and this part is for bicyc bicyclists. So we like the fact that there is a space where the bicyclists are by the curb in the at the street level and that the sidewalk belongs to people in wheelchairs and on foot. Um, and I can see it from the other perspective too. I think the bottom line is that for a lot of people with disabilities, people who ride bikes are as much of a menace as people who drive cars because they tend quite frequently not to pay attention to all of the rules um, because you, know, you see people on bikes going around this or that. They don't wanna stop at lights when when the uh, when the town council years ago approved the roundabout that went on West Street through Pomeroy intersection, one of the reasons that the councilors who were bicyclists cited was that you know that you know stopping at lights is difficult, so they like to be able to continue to move. Um, and I we have a tandem bike. I I know that it's difficult to stop at a light, but nevertheless. I think the most important people are the least able to defend themselves. They don't have a vehicle. That Some of them are going to be kids. Some of them are going to be in wheelchairs. Some of them are going to be, um, you know, elderly, and they're going to be on foot. Um, so I think everybody, uh, we like the bike lane separate. Um, I don't know enough about construction of streets and how they look in different places to know how to separate a bike lane from traffic, but I know there's not gonna be a bus pull off because there's no room. So I don't know how there could be any kind of a buffer between the road and the sidewalk because there is not 
there's no room even to put a bus pull off for which I personally am grateful because those little islands that have the bus on the other side of it are not so great. Um, so I think it's what I just said doesn't make sense. Anyway, um, I think that it's important and the committee thought it was important to make sure the pedestrians and people in wheelchairs and kids crossing the street and kids walking on the sidewalk are protected. And I think you probably need to make some, in line with what Tracy said, some recommendations to slow the traffic, at least till you get well beyond the colonial village entrance. Um, because if you're inviting people to cross the street, you got to protect them um, and make sure that the traffic goes slow enough so that they have a shot at getting there safely. Anyway, the DAAC did not do a written report. I don't think we knew we were supposed to do a written report, but we did approve of the way that this was designed because the bike lane is in the street, because the sidewalks are wide enough, because they connect uh, the people in Colonial Village to Fort River School or whatever it's gonna be called. Um, and um, we're very glad that you asked. Yeah, well, thank you, Mara, for your report. Now I'm gonna see, uh... I have one hand up from the committee, but we said the next would be to see if there are questions for either committee from mm -hmm. members of the TSO committee. And so I'll start with Bob Hegner since his hand is up. Yeah, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say um, I drive through that area uh, frequently and I have walked uh, on that sidewalk uh, and it, it's terrifying <laughs> to, to walk along that sidewalk as it is currently. Um, it's, I agree with the comments that were made. I think that we ne need to post better signage with uh, reduced speed limits. Um, I fully support um, you know, widening the road and, and putting in the bike lanes. Um, I think, however, that the the intersection there, as Belchertown Road approaches um, East Street, is very bad. Um, there's two, there are three entrances to Cumberland Farms, and if people are coming out of the middle entrance, they have to go halfway into the traffic lane in order to see the oncoming traffic. And a lot of them just cut across to take that little, I don't know what, what street that is, but the little street that's next to the bank there to, to get to East Street, uh, to go north on East Street. So anyway, I, I fully support this. I think it's a very dangerous intersection. It'll be very dangerous for children to walk on. And uh, I think having the, the, cross, the crosswalk is, is critical and having, um, you know, I think traffic calming would, would improve the situation tremendously, but I do support the project. Tracy, you said put your hands up. You muted. We can't hear you. Um, I just wanted to respond to Myra Ross's comments that I do agree with the concerns that she raised in terms of sharing the space on the sidewalk with bicyclists and pedestrians. I know that that's an issue in other places as well. I had just been trying to you know, we had just been trying to think practically about, you know, where would, for example, kids biking to Fort River bike, like, would they be biking on the street or would they be biking on the sidewalk and the sidewalk just had seemed safer to us. Um, but I, and I also strongly um, agree with the comments about needing additional traffic calming. Um, there are proposals to have the crosswalk with to have the flashing lights, but that you know, that still doesn't necessarily mean that all vehicles will stop. Like I had an experience downtown a few months ago where I was in a crosswalk with the flashing lights flashing and a vehicle did not yield at all to me and came within a few feet of me. So I, it is really important that, and, and with speed limits too, right? We can't just have speed limit signage if the road is designed for cars to go faster. So you really do need to look more comprehensively at having traffic calming measures. So instead of just advising cars to go slower or to stop at the crosswalk that they, like cars are actually doing that. And there can be things in the design to facilitate that. So um, TAC would support those as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Myra. <laughs> 
Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Oh, okay. Um, I I agree. I mean, that question is larger than uh, what we were proposed, uh, what was proposed to us. But I think it's really important for you to protect pedestrians. Um, I think that should be the most important thing. Not that it's a state highway. Um, and pedestrians, and if it has to do with bicyclists, uh, yeah, kids riding bikes um, need to be protected. Kids riding bikes need to make sure that they are following the rules of the road. Um, and I think it's a, it's a big education thing. But the most important thing is to not protect the cars, but to protect the people who are on bikes and the people who are um, on the sidewalk. And uh, you know, the, uh, I will say that one of the members of the DAAC talked about the other side of the Southeast Street uh, intersection, the part going toward town on the north side of the street where there is a sidewalk. And I guess you should know that for a person who uses a wheelchair, that sidewalk is impassable. Um, and this person, which this is terrifying, said that he has to go in the street there if he wants to go on the north side of college street toward town or away from town but on the north side uh he he's in the street and that's terrifying so there's has to be a lot of work done on all of that all all the sidewalks we have to keep people who are on sidewalks safe and if it inconveniences people who are in vehicles so be it. A uh, question for you, Myra. Do you know if the uh, problem on the north side with the person who you were referring to in wheelchair, is it uh, because of the width of the sidewalk or the condition of the sidewalk? Well, first of all, I didn't say this. It's the, I'm talking about the west side of the intersection. Okay. Right, we're, we are currently talking about the east side of the intersection. And you know, I know the road turns, so I'm using it as a general sense. I don't know specific what specifically at that point what what the you know what the uh, compass points are, but I'm talking about the 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 side between Southeast Street and the town. Okay, so the west side, and he talked about the repair of it. I'm sure it would be better if it was wider too, but he can't even use it because of the condition of it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it is a different section than I were talking about uh, right. the proposal. Yeah, so, no, I understand that. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, why, uh, my proposal would be then uh, to see Guilford, um, if you um, have any com uh, responses to the comments that have been offered so far. Uh, no, I mean, everyone pretty much agrees it's a good good process for doing a good plan. So I don't didn't have anything else to answer, add to it. There are, well, there are RFPs at the crosswalk, which those are usually authorized by the town manager as signage. So that is, is planned to do that. So, but other than that, I think everybody was, I understand the speed thing, but then again, as I'll say, and I always say, vehicle speed actually has to do with people driving the vehicles um and um you can do a lot to slow them down but some people will not some people are just going to drive what they want to drive until we can force people to or control people's vehicles um i think there was a question that was asked by tracy or point raised by tracy having to do with the points where there's a transition between the bike path and uh, where people uh, bike path ends and how that is addressed. So, so that's the transition is just, it'll be striped as a transition away and then the bike lane ends and then share the road from that point on will be posted. Are there signs or how does how do people yes there'll, there'll be a sign that says the bike path ends and then another sign below it which will be share the road okay uh, 
Any questions from anyone present about in the meeting for Guilford at this point? Seeing then, um, why don't we uh, uh, bring Mr. Kessner back in to the meeting so that he can offer the comments that he was prepared to offer earlier. Bob, if you unmute, we can. Uh... Did we lose? Um, it looks like. He's not on either list now. Yeah, it, it looks like we lost him. I'm sorry. Oh, he's back. Oh, okay. Bob, try again, and I'll, but but I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I I was trying. So first of all, I I hope you didn't lose too much time waiting for the connection to come back. Um, no, we didn't, and we can okay. hear you. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, so first of all, it, it was really nice to hear both Myra Ross, who I haven't seen for a while. Uh, very thoughtful comments from her. Obviously, Tracy and I have been discussing this recently, too. And the comments I have also are addressed to uh, uh, Guilford. And so if you don't mind, let me let me just make some minutial comments first. Bob Hegner asked about that little section of the road. I think that's still Belchertown Road, that thing that goes directly into what's there, Southeast Street still at the East Common. Um, the College Street portion, which Myra was commenting about, one of the challenges there is that the sidewalk goes up and down over numerous curb cuts. And there's a lot of traffic in and out from the parking lots there. And I can imagine, I, I walk and I bicycle through there frequently. And I can just imagine without my eyes viewing things, how challenging that might be. So that, let me now step back, way back. I think one of the bigger things we need to be thinking about, it's not the item immediately on the agenda, is that entire corridor from Rolling Ridge to the Norwatic School, or Fort River School, whatever it's going to be called, um, likely needs to be considered in the future for something like a, a wider multi-use path for folks who are walking, who are using wheelchairs, who are doing whatever they're doing on the north side. I imagine that area is ripe for further development for housing and other things. The south side has much more protected land. There's a 61A parcel where the nursery is and where the Cambodian farmers farm on the back. So that north side eventually needs to be thought of as a potential analog of the Swift Way along University Drive. That's for the future. Um, for the present, I must say that I really appreciate the plan that Guilford and Jason and Amy have put together. It's a short section. It's a, it's a place where bicycles and cars compete, especially when cars are stacking up at the traffic light heading westbound. And so having a separate area, at least uh, from the Colonial Village uh, entrance, that may be a five foot wide bike lane, which seems to be what's on the plan. I, I thank Tracy for sharing the plans with me this morning. Uh, the um, There's little room left between the curb and the property lines on the north side for a wider path. I think Myra's comments might be well addressed if a wider path could be put in there because there will be kids who will use bikes and trikes and whatever who want to use their bikes on that 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 sidewalk and we need to have enough room for folks who are walking or using wheelchairs or canes to negotiate to, to be negotiated around by the younger users okay so I, I hope that maybe the plan this is maybe with Justin Guilford if there's a way to build that path out all the way to the property line and you have a few more feet there it might be a nice thing to try there I, I regret having more pavement but that's one thing I would recommend on the north side for the sidewalk park the other thing I was going to make is a specific suggestion about this project area is the most dangerous thing for cyclists is the drains that are 
on the road surface itself. If the plan is to have drains that are uh, sort of hidden underneath the curb and the sidewalk, that'll be a boon. Having a, a drain in the roadway itself is a major danger to a cyclist in that area. And so I, I, I looked at the plans really carefully. Uh, I think that's something that needs to be looked at carefully as well. Um, one further suggestion that may address some of the speed issues. There's one more street. It's quite a distance away. It's where Stanley Street meets um, Belcher Town Road. I don't know whether including crosswalks and beacons there would have the effect of alerting people that a quarter mile further down the road, there'll be another one. I don't know whether you can put mid-block crosswalks in any good place there i don't i don't know of a good place to do it if uh the now almost abandoned uh, um old restaurant there were still an active place that might be yet one other place where a crosswalk would be appropriate but there's not much on either side now um these rapid flashing beacons work very well uh near mount holyoke college they, they have worked well in other places. I know Tracy had a bad experience with one. You know, all things considered, I think including them is a great idea, especially if they're pedestrian activated. We have a number of them along the Norwatic Rail Trail, uh, Damon Road, at uh, uh, South Maple Street and Hadley, places where there's a lot of cross traffic. I think it's a good idea to have those. Um, basically, the bottom line is, I think, I think the plan is a start. If... There were bike lanes and a wider sidewalk, well, let me call it a multi-use path, all the way on the north side from Rolling Ridge area, or at least the intersection with Gatehouse Road and Belchertown Road to this intersection. That would be a much better initial thing. I guess we don't have the resources to do that now, but that would be the way to avoid those transitions. Similarly, on the south side, uh, you know, it might be not that expensive to just widen the pavement uh, so that there's at least a, a bike lane uh, on the south side too, but that's not part of this project. Finally, I do think that the whole intersection on that north side that Bob Hegner was talking about, the, uh, the little bit of Belchstown Road that, that hooks up with east, east, southeast street there, as an access point to the, to the school, I think you need to be having a wider sidewalk there as well. Um, bicycles can probably manage that pretty well. It's it's a single lane of traffic. It's nice and wide. So a bike lane might be painted there, but maybe it's not even necessary there. But I think a wider sidewalk there would be better, a, a multi-use path. So those are my quick thoughts on this. Sorry for going so long. You know, I, I hope I can continue to work with Tracy and Guilford and Jason and Amy on further details if they're needed. I, I like that kind of stuff. I miss being part of a committee that could actually make decisions, but thanks for taking the comments. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Guilford, uh, you had provided information at the prior meeting about uh, the fact that this was uh, a grant and uh, had a very specific coverage as far as uh, where it was uh, providing mm -hmm. for the construction and uh, the timeline for uh, doing the work. Um, so do you want to remind us of uh, what those specifics are? So it's a mass works grant that's paying for this. It's a $750,000 mass works grant. The work is from, it's, it's from the split on Belchertown Road where you have the split that goes to Southeast Street before the traffic light, it goes from there and it goes just past the um, uh, entrance to Colonial Colonial Village. Um, and then there's a, another grant that's been applied for, which would take this project from the end of this project towards Stanley Street. Um, so there is another grant in the works, whether we uh, it's approved or not, we don't know at this time. We think it is approved, but we're not sure. This project has to be completed by the um, by November by the end of this calendar year. Rob, do you have a question about that? Really quick one. So, Guilford, the specific thing about the uh, inlets, the stormwater inlets, um, 
Is it possible to get those to be the type that's sort of a vertical inlet that's at the curb itself rather than something that takes a couple feet out of the uh, bike lane? Because that that bike lane, what's there now, one has to weave around and it's where the conflict between cyclists and motor vehicles is potentially fatal. So I'm wondering if you could have a design for the inlet for the storm sewers there that's uh, at the curb, as it were, rather than in the road itself. They're actually, they exist. Yeah. They're, they're actually in the roadway. They're not, uh, they're drop inlets, they're not curb inlets. Yeah, I know the other ones exist. Where I grew up, that's the only kind that would work for the reason I stayed. Yes, well, where I grew up too, they were curb inlets. There were no drops, um, but there's a problem with uh, snow removal in the winter. So if global warming keeps going up, maybe you might switch more to the curb inlets. Okay, well, if you can hear me still, I say, think about it, <laughs> please. Thanks. So back to the committee, do we have uh, any questions from the committee about the proposal? So otherwise, uh, I know that the, what is required from the council side is that uh, because uh, this is modifications to the public way, <clears throat> the, it requires council action uh under our current public way policy and uh the committee is being asked to make a recommendation so uh, we need to move in that direction uh council ryan i'm prepared to make a motion um go ahead um, I move that TSO recommend to the town council that the council approve the public way request for Belcher Town Road. Second. So there's a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Because we've had a lot of very good comments. Uh, and I don't know, I guess it's not clear to me whether the uh, Guilford and the department are going to be able to make any modifications to address anything differently than was in the original proposal. Um, Brian? Uh, Guilford, you were about to say something. I mean, we can't. The drainage will be where it, where we have a plan that we cannot change this type of structure right now. It's it doesn't work as well in this area. And then uh, we are on the north side. The sidewalk is pushed all the way back to the property line. So we've already had pushed the sidewalk back to the property line. We're using just about every inch of space we can in the layout. On the south side, there's more room between the sidewalk and the bike lane because we didn't want to have to pay for moving the telephone and power poles. So there is more green space on the south side. Councilor Ryan? I think it's your call, Andy, but you could include some of the, and perhaps you are planning to do this, you could include some of the comments um, from uh, uh, Attack uh, and from uh, uh, Myra Ross's committee um, uh, as part of your report to the council, just to raise some of these concerns. Without um, doesn't affect our recommendation, but that's that's something we could do if you wish. Yeah, no, I think point noted. So, is there any other uh, discussion requests from the committee? If not, then uh, I think we need to just proceed to a vote. So we'll go ahead with the vote. Uh, Councillor uh, Bob Hegner. Aye. <clears throat> Council Lord. Aye. Councillor Ryan. Aye. And I'm an aye. So it's four to, four to zero with one member absent. And the motion 
carries. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I see Angela's hand is up and I'm gonna recognize her, but we're also gonna move to the outreach discussion. So Andy, I am sad to say Jennifer and I are both involved in um, interviews for the communications manager and we have them scheduled beginning at 11. I know that um, Jen and I are both excited to speak with you about outreach and what's been going on with CPOs, but um, we're going to have to punt. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. And I'm more than welcome, um, happy to come back at your next meeting if needed to, I won't be employed, but if you need anything from me, I'm happy to. Yeah, I'm very sorry. Um, let me just uh, do something really quickly, and because I, uh, we are going to have to uh, figure out what we're going to do with this. But um, I think this is what I want to share if it comes across. Oops, that isn't the right thing that came up, so I'm going to have to go back. Uh, what I was looking for is the, uh, see if I can, is the sharing showing up on your screens or not? It's your, the agenda. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Trying to get to the, oh, uh, here we go. Stop share. I, what I was going to do really quickly, if I could, oh, yeah, is just that. show yeah, the uh, uh, committee charge, and uh, if that's available to me, um, I will, and if not, we're not going to worry about it now. Um, gonna, uh, we'll, we'll skip it for now. What I was going to point out is that um, the committee charge itself has a section that uh, has uh, four pieces that have to do with the outreach. And what we wanted to do is to try and get a report and a discussion going about the committee charge as it's written. And uh, so as a uh, consequence uh, um, of not being able to do it today, yeah, I'm very sorry uh, that we got uh, communications uh, mixed up about timing. Uh, but Jennifer, um, thank you for all that you've done for the town. And we look forward to finding a time to have you back at um, uh, one of our future meetings, I uh, will do it as quickly as possible, because I really think that uh, we need to have this discussion about outreach. One of the pieces that was involved was um, uh, the uh, role of the community participation officers, and the two of you are uh, currently the uh, CPOs. And I know that Angelo is going to do a report on that, which uh, we'll do at the next meeting. Uh, so um, thank you to you both. I'm sorry that we uh, had difficulty today. And uh, looks like you need to get going. Yes, I do. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Bye. Thank you, Angelo. So the only other thing that we can do on uh, today you know, uh, uh, is to go to the committee plan and uh, uh, as far as meeting schedule plan, it's not formally on the agenda, but it's not uh, an action item. Um, it's uh, purely a discussion item unless Athena thinks we can't uh, do that. We can just briefly talk about it. But Councilor Ryan, your hand is up. I wanted to see what 
Yeah, I'm just wondering, Andy, if we could at least do uh, item 5A. Um, I agree with you, we can't do the real meat of this discussion because of, of the timing issue, but 5A uh, relates to the FAQ, which is something I think mm -hmm. Athena had raised, and I had put a document in our a, a folder, actually, Athena put it in for me, thank you, um, that begins to, to address that question and also other resources for constituents, including what we currently have on our website that's public facing. So I don't know what you feel or what the other members of the committee feel, but I'm wondering if we could at least uh, talk briefly about 5A. Um, I was curious, uh, I mean, it, I, I think you should uh, go ahead and say a little bit more about what you're thinking, but also how it relates to the committee charge. And that's... Yeah, the, uh, the three items that are currently on our website are what we provide the public um, as a committee. Um, one of them is our charge. One of them is the public ways... Uh, process that we follow. And the third is a document that I, I put or had put in the uh, folder that if uh, maybe we don't want to talk about it today, maybe we're not uh, ready to, but I would hope that the counselors would look at it because if anyone goes to our website and actually looks at what we have up there, that document is somewhat problematic, I think, um, both in the condition it's in at the moment, it actually reads as a draft. Um, so it shouldn't really be there, I think, in that form. Um, and also there's the content question. Uh, people need to read it and see if that's the actual um, policy that they want to endorse as the current members of the committee. So I, I brought it up as outreach because, first of all, it's, it's one of the three documents that we make available to the public who come to the TSO website. Um, the other document is just a list of links and some notes about uh, the issue of people trying to um, figure out how to communicate with the town about issues related to property um, or to uh, uh, nuisances of various kinds, whether they be uh, fallen trees or sidewalk damage or uh, whatever. Um, and at one point we had mentioned or I had mentioned that the committee might consider creating some kind of, of, of resource um, that may not be appropriate, but I, I still like us to talk about it at some point, or perhaps can be put on the town website that would help people um, uh, in as they navigate the website to register complaints, um, particularly related to um, the kinds of things that we often hear about. Um, some of them go to, to um, inspections, some of them go to DPW. It's a somewhat somewhat confusing uh, process. Um, and so I thought there might be a way that we could, as a committee, help. And so I consider that outreach. Um, so that's why I put them in, or asked them to be put in the packet. And I assume they relate to the committee charge because we're about how we communicate with the public related to services. The, uh, but you're looking to the website as being the place that the link occurs. Uh, that's the place where um, we as a committee um, create, we have three documents that we have available to the public um, who, who come to learn more about TSO. Whether we should put anything else there, I think, was something that we started to discuss and there was some uh, disagreement. Um, I felt that we could put something else there, like an FAQ, um, but that's something we need to talk about. Um, and then, as I said, there's a document currently on the website that I put in the packet that, if anyone looks at it, should raise some questions and concerns. So we may not want to talk about it today, but I think I wanted to have people at least have it visible to them because it's visible to the public. I don't know if anyone looks at it, but it's there for them to look at. And if they do look at it, 
um, I think they would be puzzled at the least. Other than, I, I guess I have to go back and look at the website. Is it, other than the, through the packet today, do they, are they really available? And uh, the other comment that I generally have, and then see if the other members of the committee have any thoughts about this, is that, uh, you know, one of our, community participation officers originally was uh, Brianna Sunreed and the website was her domain and communications was her domain. And I think that it's a position that uh, they're working on filling and uh, the, so the, we could be getting back to an additional uh, community participation officer with those uh, responsibilities and that might then create opportunities that we don't have now. So I think that uh, is there any at this point do we uh, is there anything? It, it, I just don't know that it's a conversation we can make much progress with today. So, um, trying to see what. I know what you have fun. Let me uh, do one other thing, um, and then I think we probably can adjourn for today because I don't think we're going to, uh, without our community participation officers and uh, without Jennifer, I'm not sure that, and I know that Athena has to, has to leave the meeting to, um, so what I was going to do real quickly is um, put this document on the screen just so that we know what our next meetings are. And um, then we can, uh, as you'll see, uh, when we get into June, we don't have anything on the uh, agendas yet for the 16th and the 27th. So um, our next, uh, other than the listening session, the, the listening session that we have scheduled, which is on a very specific topic and is not going to be uh, posted as a council meeting. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, Athena and I had had a discussion about this and uh, if we do not have any discussion, if it is purely a listening session without any deliberation, uh, then uh, it does not have to be posted as a council meeting, even if there's more than a uh, quorum of the council present, uh, which could happen if there are five members of our committee and two district councilors would be seven. But if we have no deliberation uh, and it's only a listening session, it does not have to be posted as a council meeting. So that would be a change uh, to what would happen on the 13th. On the um, 16th is a regular meeting of the committee and uh, the uh, uh, we've been waiting for a long time to have a waste hauler discussion and Heatherstone Road. And then what I was uh, hoping to do is to have um, the police chief or chief's designee uh, and the department and transportation advisory committee meeting with us and have a general discussion about topics of 
traffic calming, speed limits, and um, Henry Street, uh, because there's a Henry Street recommendation from the engineers that have been studying the topic. And uh, um, then we can actually have a discussion about Heatherstone Road. So I wanted to put the, those into a single meeting. And uh, that seemed like uh, the uh, appropriate time to do that. So uh, I think we would probably um, have to postpone outreach until June 13. Um, but I want to uh, get your comments on that, and then, uh, uh, but we can't act on it because we don't have it on the agenda. Uh, Council Ryan. So the listening session on five thirteen. Um, does that require a quorum? Uh, I think it will be a committee meeting. It will require. It will be a listed as a committee meeting as opposed to just a listening session. Okay. Well, it doesn't do the good to have the committee ask to have a listening session so we can listen to the public and not be there. Um, it is recorded, is it not? Uh, I assume it, it Maybe it isn't. Recorded. I don't know. It is? So it is going to be on Zoom. Yeah, so it's recorded. Okay. Um. Could you just I for the five five sixteen meeting? Um, I kind of lost the thread there. Um, our next uh, official meeting would be waste hauler essentially. Uh, waste hauler and first Heatherstone Road. Oh, you, you have the Stone Road as well. Okay. Okay. I think it would be worth having a discussion shortly after the listening session. That makes sense to and me. And then we can, uh, if there are questions that we want to refer uh, for further discussion, I don't think we have to make a decision on that meeting. We could. There would be no reason not to be posted, but we don't have to. So if you have any comments about uh, the meeting plan, then please uh, send them to me and uh, Athena and I will uh, work on a final schedule. So with that said, um, I don't think that there's any uh, Thing for us to continue for uh, today's meeting. I think it, we've been very productive. We've had good discussion on two very important issues, made recommendations, and uh, if uh, nobody has anything else to raise, I would take a motion to adjourn. I move. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded to adjourn. Uh, so let's just take a vote. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Councilor Ryan. Aye. And uh, I'm an aye, so it's four to zero with one member absent. And we're adjourned. Um, I'm sorry, we did not get to have the discussion we had hoped to have about outreach, but we will get it rescheduled. So thank you.